In this video, I want to provide a short introduction to Gibbs sampling. So what is Gibbs sampling? So it's a way of sampling from probability distributions of two plus dimensions. And like the Metropolis algorithm, it is a method of Markov chain Monte Carlo. So that means it's a type of dependent sampling algorithm. However, unlike the Metropolis algorithm, we accept all proposals. Indeed, it is possible to show that the Gibbs sampling algorithm is a special case of the Metropolis algorithm and vice versa. And the Gibbs sampling algorithm is, again, like the Metropolis algorithm, often used in Bayesian inference. And it is actually the kind of method that underlies the bugs and JAGS languages. Here, in order to explain what is meant by Gibbs sampling, I'm going to use an example, and then hopefully through the example you should see kind of how this process works, and then afterwards I will formally define the algorithm. So the example we're going to use is the case of horse racing. So we imagine that there are two horses, A and B, and they race on the same day but in separate events. And those horses can either win the event, in which case their particular random variable is equal to one, or they don't win the event, in which case their random variable is equal to zero. And we suppose that there is this joint probability distribution of A and B. Further, suppose that what we want to do is to sample from this joint distribution. So what do I mean by sample from this joint distribution? Well, what we would be doing is we would be generating sequences of paired outcome. So here we might first of all sample a value of 0, 0, the first 0 indicating that horse A did not win its race, and the second 0 also indicating that horse B did not win its own race. And then we might sample 0, 1, then say 0, 1 again, etc. So we're generating sequences of paired events here, where each of the pairs that we sample has a probability that's given by this table here. So the probability of A and B both losing is given by the top left corner, and that's a 0.1 probability. So there is a simple way to generate independent samples from this joint distribution, which is to take the unit interval and basically chop it up. So that this first quadrant here is of area 0.1, then we have the next area, which is, say, 0 0.4. So this would be the next area. And the first area, 0 0.1 here, would correspond to a 0, 0 event, so both horses losing. Then we have the 0 0.4 event, which is corresponding to when A wins but B loses. And then we chop up the last two bits according to 0 0.3 and 0 0.2 to correspond to the other two cases in our table. Then what we do is we generate a uniform number between 0 and 1, and we basically figure out which of these compartments it falls in, and whichever compartment it falls in, that corresponds to a particular paired set of outcomes. However, what I want to illustrate in this video is how we can use a different method, which is Gibbs sampling, to enable us to sample from this joint distribution. And whilst it seems more complicated than this simple method that I've outlined just now for this simple case, in more complex examples, you can't use simple rules like the one I've just highlighted, especially for continuous parameters. So what Gibbs sampling relies on us knowing are the conditional distributions and being able to independently sample from those conditional distributions. So firstly, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what the conditional distributions of A conditioned on particular values of B look like. So we're going to have two different conditional distributions here, one where we're conditioned on the fact that b equals 0, and the other where b is equal to 1. So if b is equal to 0, then essentially if we look back at our joint table, that is corresponding to these two outcomes here. So our new probability space essentially collapses just to this row. So because it collapses down to this row, what we need to do is we need to normalize each of these values by the sum of the entries of the row. So the sum of row entries here are just 0.5. So to work out the probability that A equals 0 
given that b equals zero, then we just take the 0.1 value and we divide it through by the row sum, so we just get 1 fifth. And then for the other term in this conditional distribution, so when we're conditioning on b being equal to 0, we take the 0.4 value and then we divide it through by 0.5, so we get 4 fifths. So we notice that this row here is a valid probability distribution. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create a different valid probability distribution where we condition on b being equal to 1. So when b is equal to 1, we are just restricting ourselves to this bottom row case here, in which case what we need to do is again we need to renormalize. So we divide each of the corresponding probability values through by the row sum. So firstly we get a value of 3 fifths, so that's just 0.3 divided by 0.5, and then we get 2 fifths. So again, we get a valid probability distribution in this bottom row. Now what I want to do is I want to do the same, but I want to generate the probability distribution of B conditioned on A. So now we're going to be looking at the columns, whereas before we were looking at the rows. So now suppose that we're conditioning on the fact that A is being equal to zero. Then if we look back at our joint distribution, that is corresponding to these two set of values here. So what we need to do is we need to divide through each of these values by the sum of that column. So here we just sum them together and we get 0.4 and we might as well do it for the other column because we're going to need it in a minute. If we sum these two values together we get 0.6. So firstly for the probability of B conditioned on A being equal to 0, to get those values we divide 0.1 by 0.4 and then we'll divide 0.3 by 0.4. So firstly we get one quarter and then we get three quarters. So we notice that in this column we have a valid probability distribution. Then we do the same thing but in the second column. So now we're conditioning on a being equal to one and so we're going to divide each of these values by the respective column sum. So firstly we get 0.4 over 0.6 which is just two thirds and then we get 0.2 over 0.6 so we get a third. So we notice that we have four possible conditional distributions. We have the probability distribution of A conditioned on B being equal to zero. We have the probability distribution of A conditioned on B being equal to one. We have the probability distribution of B conditioned on A being equal to zero. And we have the probability distribution of B conditioned on A being equal to one. And basically, because there are only two outcomes for each of these conditional probability distributions, it's in effect the same probability distribution as flipping a coin, albeit one which has some bias. So, for example, if we were considering the probability distribution of A conditioned on B being equal to zero, that would be like throwing a coin where the probability of heads was given by four fifths. And let us suppose that, as is the case with, I think, most statistical software, we are able to computationally simulate throws of such a bias coin. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the results of simulations of the Gibbs sampling algorithm for this example. So what does the Gibbs sampling algorithm look like here? Well, first of all, we start off by sampling a value of A and B from some arbitrary probability distribution, which has support over the allowed values of A and B. In other words, it only generates A being equal to zero or one, and similarly for B. Then what we do, is we iterate for iteration t in one to sort of large t here, we do the following. Firstly, we sample a value of a from the conditional probability distribution of a, where we condition on b, the previous value of b that we sampled. Then what we do is we use this value of a that we've just independently sampled to define a conditional probability distribution of b, where we condition on a t, and we sample from B there, and we independently sample B from this distribution. So notice what we're doing here, we're using the previous value of B in the previous iteration to define a conditional probability distribution for A that we independently sample from. Then we use that value of A to define a conditional probability distribution for B, and we sample B from that independently. So now what I want to do is I want to illustrate this process visually. So I have these four possible outcomes represented by these four dots on the screen here. 
And here, I just so happened to have sampled a value of 0, 0 as my starting point. Then what we're going to do is we're going to update A by using the conditional distribution of A when B is equal to 0, because we're first of all starting off with B being equal to 0. And the corresponding probability distribution for each of the possible values of A are shown above each of the values of A. So this value here, if you look back in the table, is 1 -fifth, and this value here is 4 fifths. So we're going to independently sample a value of a from that, and if we do so, it happens that we pick a being equal to 1, so we move there. Then what we do is we update b by sampling from the probability distribution of b conditioned on a being equal to 1. So now we're choosing between each of these two dots here, and the corresponding conditional probability distribution is shown to the right of each of these dots. And if you look up these values in the table, this one here is one third, and this one here corresponds to two thirds. So if we carry out that independent sampling, it turns out that we move here, in this case, to A and B being equal to one. Then what we do is we do the same thing for A. So now we're choosing between each of these two dots here. And notice that the conditional distribution that we're drawing from this time is different to what we drew from last time when we were drawing for A because now b is equal to 1, so we're conditioning on b being equal to 1, whereas previously we were conditioning on b being equal to 0. And we move again, and we essentially then iterate this process. So now I'm going to do the same for b. What do we do? We move again for b, and we continue this process over and over again. And what we kind of see is if we iterate this process continually, and we look at the number of values which we've sampled from each of these locations, then eventually we will see that we approximate the underlying joint probability distribution. Now I want to back up just what I said by showing that if we continue to iterate these two steps, that eventually our sampling distribution approximates well the true joint distribution. So now what I'm showing by the area of the black dots is the true joint distribution. And the pink areas that currently is just on the A and B being equal to zero case because I'm starting here are the sampling distribution values. And so what we can see is as we run this algorithm that the sampling distribution soon starts to well approximate the true underlying probability distribution which is given by the black dots. And so that after we run a few thousand iterations here we get a very good approximation. And in fact, after 10,000 iterations, it's very hard to tell the difference between the true distribution, which is the black dots, and the pink ones, because essentially they're just exactly the same size. So we've seen here that 10,000 iterations from this algorithm results in a sampling distribution that well approximates the joint. Now that I've illustrated that Gibbs sampling works for this two-dimensional discrete distribution, I want to formally define it. So I'm going to define it using a three-dimensional probability distribution, which may be discrete, it may be continuous, of three parameters, theta one, theta two, and theta three. So here we're supposing that what we want to do is to generate samples from this three-dimensional probability distribution. In Gibbs sampling, like in Metropolis, we first of all start off by sampling some values of theta one, theta two, and theta three, randomly from some arbitrary probability distribution, which is simple to draw samples from, but still has support over the allowed values of theta one, theta two, and theta three. Then what we do for iteration little t in one to big T is firstly, there is sometimes a randomization step here where you randomize the order in which you're going to do the updating, but that's not essential, so I'm gonna leave that out for the time being. So we're going to imagine that we're going to update theta 1, then theta 2, then theta 3 in each of the iterations here, because I've chosen a non-randomized parameter update ordering. So firstly, what we're going to do is we're going to sample a value of theta 1 from the conditional distribution of theta 1, where we condition on theta 2 in the previous iteration and theta 3 in the previous iteration. So we independently sample a value of theta 1 from this conditional then what we do is we do the same for theta 2, but we use the just recently produced value of theta 1 to define a conditional probability distribution. 
So now we sample a value of theta 2 conditioned on theta 1 t and theta 3 t minus 1. Then what we do is we use the recently produced values of theta 1 and theta 2 to define a conditional probability distribution which we sample from for theta 3. So we condition here on theta 1 t and theta 2 t. So like random walk metropolis, under quite general conditions, this algorithm is guaranteed to asymptotically converge to the target distribution. Here, the joint probability distribution of theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. However, you'll notice that the requirements for this algorithm are slightly more stringent than that for random walk metropolis. However, unlike random walk metropolis, you'll notice that there is no accept reject here. We're just accepting all of our proposals. They're all just sampled from the respective conditional probability distribution. And so because we don't reject any proposals, Gibbs sampling in general is more efficient at exploring parameter space than random walk metropolis. However, the conditions to be able to use this algorithm are more stringent than for random walk metropolis. We need to know what each of these conditional probability distributions is and we need to be able to independently sample from them. And in general, finding these conditional probability distributions can be difficult or impossible for many applied examples. Also, another problem with Gibbs sampling, which is also a problem for random walk metropolis, is that it can be very slow for correlated parameters. And the reason for that is that if we've got two very correlated dimensions here, in other words, the probability distribution is very correlated, so imagine we can represent that by a contour plot, which looks something like that, which I'm drawing now. Then the conditional probability distributions actually aren't that wide. So for example, if we condition on a value of theta 2, which is somewhere like that, then typically the values of theta 1 that we draw from are somewhere in here. Because of the correlation in the parameters, that means that Gibbs sampling tends to do quite a slow snaking path across posterior space that will look something like this pink line that I'm drawing here. And because of this snaking way in which it moves up a diagonal landscape, it actually takes Gibbs sampling a long time to explore posterior space when we have a high degree of correlation between parameters here. What we'd ideally like to do is walk in the diagonal direction. Random walk metropolis does allow you to walk in that diagonal direction, but unfortunately it proposes values that are frequently off of that diagonal. So we only accept a very small minority of cases. Where, as we shall see later on, that Hamiltonian Monte Carlo actually allows us to get the best of both worlds, we can walk in the diagonal direction and we accept a high proportion of steps. In situations where we have highly correlated parameters, it can actually make a lot of sense to use Gibbs sampling update in blocks of parameters, where the blocks correspond to those parameters that are highly correlated with one another. So suppose that theta 1 and theta 2 are correlated with one another, then what we want to do is we'd want to sample from the conditional distribution of theta 1 and theta 2 conditioned on theta 3 here. And it will turn out that this sampling method in general is more efficient than just sampling from the unidimensional conditional distributions. But unfortunately, much like we can't always derive conditional probability distributions which are univariate, it's generally harder to find ones which are multivariate. So this is even harder in general than deriving the univariate rules that we've needed so far. So in summary, Gibbs sampling is a way of sampling from a two plus dimensional probability distribution. It's a variant of Markov chain Monte Carlo, and it requires us to know the conditional probability distributions. It can be much, much more efficient than random walk metropolis at exploring posterior space because we don't reject any steps. However, it does require us to know the conditional probability distributions and be able to independently sample from them both of which may be difficult in practice.